I work on the emergence of life. Are we alone in the universe, Michael? Uh, no, but I, I wouldn't say we. I mean, the, the bacteria and the, the prokaryotes, the ordinary small cells, they'll be many places. Uh, so intelligent life will be pretty rare, I think, and probably short-lived, I'm afraid to say. So you think we, the, uh, the life forms on Earth, are not alone in the universe? Yes. But we, the techno-civilization, homo sapiens, are probably alone in the universe? Oh no, I think that because there's so many billions and billions of, of uh, planets, billions of stars, billions of galaxies, there's bound to be life elsewhere, even coming to our kind of state. But, uh, but there's so much time, what, we're 13.7 billion years old, so there'd be all kinds of times that this might have taken place. So I don't, I don't really expect to find intelligent life elsewhere for us, I'm afraid. Because it's short-lived? Partly because it's probably relatively short-lived, yes. How short? This is because uh, our clock is ticking. Well, I, well, it depends what you, the technological universe, uh, the technological uh, civilizations I think probably fairly short, and I don't want to really put a number on it, but I guess within a uh, couple of thousand years, so maybe, maybe a little more. Uh-huh, all right, so let's talk about the origin of life. now. A lot of astronomers, when I ask them the question, are we alone, they'll say, no, we're not alone. And, and I say, why? He says, because the universe is so big. Of course, they have known nothing about the probability of life, and so they're just assuming it's, it's outweighed by the sheer d size of the universe. Uh, do you agree with that? Not really. I think that kind of harks back to the Drake equation, and I don't, I don't like that kind of argument. I think that uh, li life exists uh, to basically use up or dissipate free energy or uh, gradients in, in a, a world like ours. And uh, so I don't think that it happens everywhere. And, and certainly intelligent life, for example, one of the amazing things about uh, our planet is the, the depth of the ocean. It's just, what, four or five kilometers deep at, uh, on, on average, and, and we've got 30% of the world is covered with continents. I think that might be rather unusual. Either planets might be dry or very wet. And of course, you can't make telescopes if you've got a five, uh, 10 kilometer or 50 kilometer uh, ocean if, because there would be no continents. So to get, have complex life, I think you need some dry land. Oh, so you think wet rocky planets well, might be common, but ones with shallow oceans will not be? That might, yes, that, might, uh, that doesn't stop there be, being life. I mean, any, any wet rocky planet of around about our size, and perhaps a little smaller and a little larger, will, will uh, contain life because the disequilibria, uh, the chemical disequilibria on such a planet needs to be spent. Well, can't you, the chemical equilibria be spent on far from equilibrium dissipative systems that don't include what we traditionally call life? It like, may be, but uh, we don't know of one. We don't know of? We don't know of one. We don't know of an alternative way of spending, for example, for if, if, if you take the view, which I do, that life's job on our planet is to hydrogenate carbon dioxide, then there's nothing, no other way of doing it, and that's the major disequilibrium. So to hydrogenate carbon dioxide because it increases the entropy? Yeah, increases entropy and produces a small but ever continuous number of organic molecules. Aren't there any other structures like hurricanes or fires or convection cells that are far from equilibrium that hydrogenate carbon dioxide? No. No, so it's only life yeah. that do I that. I mean, they do their own job, of course, but they're, they're, they're doing a job primarily for physics, for, for physics and its disequilibria. And the paradox of the physical disequilibria, for example, convection in a planet, is to put chemistry in the lurch, to put chemistry far from equilibrium, and metabolism comes, uh, is coupled to convection. But there's photochemical disequilibria, and there, we don't have any life that takes advantage of the photochemical in the atmosphere equilibrium, right? Disequilibrium. Well, we, I mean, apart from oxygenic photosynthesis and other photosynthesis uh, mechanisms, and there are, of course, uh, other lysis mechanisms using solar, solar energy or some such, but they don't actually, I mean, apart from photosynthesis, they don't make much of a difference to the... Uh, they don't contain, well, let's put it another way, that, that in comes a high energy photon, <clears throat> and because of entropy, 20 low entropy photons go out. Yes. So one to 20. There's no other mechanism that, that does that, uh, apart from oxygenic photosynthesis and other photosyntheses. I thought that if the, doesn't the moon do that too? Well, it doesn't have an atmosphere, it doesn't have the problem of this. I know, but it has one photon coming in and it's about the same temperature as the Earth, so therefore 20 go out. Uh, well, I, that's, I didn't know that. That's interesting to know. Is it, is it the same? 
It, I think I it must it be close to the same because the okay. surface, the average surface temperature, you know, the moon and the Earth are the same distance from the sun, and I guess there's some warming due to our atmosphere in general, but that, that warming would make fewer, it would make fewer photons go out. And the moon, be, being colder, it would have like one to 30 or one to 25. Well, that's a very, I mean, I would like to have to go, I'd like to some research on that, and I'm, okay. I'm obviously, I'm ignorant about this. But okay. I, I was following Penrose and Lovelock and so on, okay. by saying that this is the way this planet, with its green greenery, actually generates low entropy protons. Now, you are known protons. for one of the major uh, scenarios for the origin of life on this planet. Can you tell us what that is? Well, it would start with the fact that the planet like ours, uh, a wet, rocky planet, is like a battery. And the battery's output is about one volt. And therefore, uh, it, and the way to spend it is through something like a fuel cell. And life is a fuel cell. And that's the way that free energy is spent, actually, and used up. So uh, I think, so we'd look for a place where that might be focused, that kind of chemical disequilibrium might be focused. So we thought that we would go for an alkaline vent uh, on the sea floor on, in the Hadean times uh, uh, 4.3 billion years ago and that's where it would interface an ocean that was carbonic in other words it has not carbon dioxide within the ocean and the interaction between the alkaline solution uh, when the alkaline solution titrates from uh, alkaline springs into the ocean it, it makes a whole mess of uh, precipitate. So there is a kind of frustration at the interface between the alkaline spring, subsea floor, and the ocean itself. And ma the materials that get uh, precipitated these days are things like what's called brucite, which is magnesium hydroxide, and also calcium carbonate. Of course, 4.4 billion years ago, it would have been entirely different because the ocean was very different. It was, re it was reduced, there was no oxygen. What it did have was a huge amount of iron, for example, in the banded iron formations, which are the major chemical precipitate in the Archean. And they appear to be made of a mineral called green rust. And that is our assumption that the first uh, kind of enzymatic or engines of life were probably green rust and they formed round about alkaline vents 4.4 billion years ago. Now you'd expect green rust and alkaline vents on any rocky, wet rocky planet in the universe? Uh, probably, but I mean it does depend on the solar input as well. So uh, my, I suppose one of my points about, of course I'm interested in astrobiology, but it's hard enough for me to work on w origin of life on one planet to, to worry about it too much on another one. I mean, I'm working on Europa as a possibility as well. Uh, and that's a very different kind of planet. And that's using the kind of radiation you get from Jupiter, uh, which is very high. And it would, but nevertheless, it would generate the same kind of disequilibrium. But astronomers, uh, the more they look at the Earth and the Sun, they don't seem to be anything unique about the Earth uh, compared to the other wet, rocky planets. And so, all, and the chemistry will be very similar. Well, uh, it's size matters in this case, in that uh, a planet this size, there's a, there's a mineral, that, well, the, the mantle is made up of a mineral called olivine, which is iron, magnesium, silicate. And uh, at about uh, 620 kilometers deep on this planet, as Ber people like Bernie would have pointed out, there is a transition, a major transition to some a mineral called perovskite, now, perovskite normally has alumina in it, absolutely required for its stability. But there is no alumina in olivine. So what happens is you get a disproportionation of the iron in the olivine to go into uh, this mineral called perovskite. Now, that may seem a rather uh, complicated way of looking about this, but that made our particular mantle rather oxidized. So it means that all the volcanoes, ever since the beginning of, the, of our planet with water on it, has, has been disgorging carbon dioxide. And Darwin, after all, a, a geologist, was, uh, and geologists ever since have all realized that that's it. Carbon dioxide comes out of the volcanoes just because the mantle is relatively oxidized. If you go to much smaller areas, much smaller planets, you'd have much less uh, carbon dioxide. In fact, you probably have methane and hydrogen, that would be the most of it. And therefore, there'll be no dis chemical disequilibrium to spend. But uh, there are plenty of Earth-like, Earth-sized planets between 0.9 and 1.1 Earth oh, radius. Yeah, for example. Okay. Sure. So they would be they would be candidates for this type Definitely. of process. Definitely. If they've got wet, if they've got water, and they've incoming kind of some kind of solar energy. Uh, some kind of radiation, then they will definitely have life. They, they couldn't. They couldn't be helped. It's, it's inevitable. So you're saying any time there is a chemical redox gradient, you will have life. Well, the, the gradient has to be particular. I mean, I would say, for example, the prebiotic molecule, uh, I might be alone in this, but the really prebiotic molecule is carbon dioxide. 
and everything we eat for breakfast and some of our clothes, it all relates to, they were all carbon dioxide before they became organic molecules. So I think, and that's the significant thing, and that's a true as you go down the evolutionary tree as well. As you go down to the bottom of the evolutionary tree, tree it's quite clear that the acetyl coenzyme A synthase pathway, or something like it, actually was involved in reducing carbon dioxide to organic molecules, such as acetate, for example, pyruvate, and so on. But can't you have these types of reactions without having a DNA-based life? Can't you just do it and create acetate and then have a reaction that goes forward driven by the, the uh, I guess, the redox potential, but not DNA, no coded information, no life as we know it? Well, you mentioned hurricanes and to start with, and the problem with the hurricane, of course, it... It's, it's not chemical, it, right? Well, it's not chemical, but nevertheless, it, the point is it doesn't, have a, it doesn't have much of a memory. It has some memory. Uh, during its lifetime, but it cannot pass that memory on. But why and, do you need a memory to hydrogenate carbon dioxide? You d well, because one of the re reasons is because there are a lot of niches that are very similar, have a similar disequilibrium, but have not been discovered by earliest life. And you could think of evolution as the search engine for equivalent kind of niches. And evolution has basically flowered out to fill those niches. Uh, and those niches are generally using carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, generally, not always. Uh, and uh, hydrogen, for example, from organic molecules or hydrogen itself, or it just plain electrons. So let me get this straight. You think that if rocky wet planets are around every star close to what's called the circumstellar habitable zone that we should expect life on them. Yes. Is Now some people think that once you have life it goes everywhere and kind of fills the planet. Is that something that uh, yes. you would predict because these redox gradients are so um, ubiquitous? Well I'd say that's exactly right. It's a, the, uh, it, it fills all those niches and as I repeat it's uh, it's a search engine for such niches, and anything remotely like it, however deep or however high, is going to uh, get exploited by such uh, organisms. But, but Mars, uh, may, what happens if the, the planet is unstable and it goes either gets too cold or gets too hot? I would have thought that would kill off a lot of the life, and then the life would kind of retreat or get marginalized to very small niches, and then would just hang on for, its, for dear life. And then there would be a planet with not flourishing life everywhere like the Earth, but maybe Mars has some life that's still kind of eking out its existence, at, but a very minimal level. Sure. Well, I, I mean, if we, Mars is very particular. If you were to take your argument uh, more generally, then you would, re, I think, we'd th see just how hard it is to kill life. You know, any, any gardener would know that it's very hard to get rid of the weeds, and every doctor knows it's very hard to get rid of the bacteria. You know. It, it, these, once you've got this going concern with DNA and so forth, this memory system, then it just is very hard to kill off. So you do not think that there is a special recipe that makes the origin of life improbable? You kind of would, would agree with Christian Dedu's statement that life is a cosmic imperative. Yes, and it's a along with him, I'd say it's a continuum from geochemistry to biochemistry. Okay, now do you have a favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? No, I don't. Okay. What kind of aliens would you like to meet? I don't, I don't like to meet any alien. I mean, I think any alien that comes here will not have uh, kindness on its mind. <laughs> so you're afraid of meeting aliens? No, I'm not afraid of them because I don't think that they're anywhere close, personally. If I gave, now, many of us are interested not just with the origin of life on Earth, but the life elsewhere. And if I gave you $100 billion to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend the money? Uh, I'd, I'd say to you, I don't want a hundred million dollars. I'd say, oh, I'd say hundred billion. No, I don't want a hundred billion dollars. I'm I'm, Rutherford said once when he discovered the nucleus that uh, a, a reporter asked him, you know, how you, the other countries had much more, much more money. How was it that he discovered the nucleus? And he said, well, we didn't have much money, so we had to think more. <laughs> and I think being flooded with money is very bad news for anybody who's working on theory. You need stepped amounts of money as each, as each hypothesis generates perhaps a new one, a new, a new, a new uh, testable hypothesis, then that's when you bring in the money and it's a bit at a time maybe. So I don't want, I mean, it would be nice to have a five million. I'm not saying it wouldn't, and, uh, you know, I could probably do quite a lot with five million. And what I would do is go back to the laboratory and work on my favorite mineral, which I think is just like an engine or an enzyme. 
And right at the beginning of life, you had to have something lying around the kind of garage floor that life could co-opt because all life co the way evolution works is generally by co-option of, of one particular mechanism for another and time and time again and we would say that's true even at the emergence of life it, life originally co-opted minerals to get started now Carl Sagan in debates with Ernst Meyer they talked about they're debating the topic of whether we should expect human-like intelligence elsewhere and uh, Carl Sagan said there are multiple pathways to functionally equivalent humans. Do you have any opinion on that? Well, I think that there probably are several pathways. I think that it's, I mean, on a planet like this, you could say that had it not been for the uh, explosion, you know, 66 million years ago on our planet, then maybe the dinosaurs would have just kept alive, but maybe they would have been, uh, developed an intelligence. And that, it's almost inevitable for a complex organism with dry land and surrounded by water to develop such a complex uh, system because what they can do is that they can beef up the entropy generation hugely. So what, so what normally what life does is it kind of uses the yearly or five yearly or ten yearly uh, cycles. But we we can use the iron from those uh, iron formations I was talking about three and a half billion years ago. Uh, and we can use it to make our Iron Age, and then we can use, and then, but we need coal to smelt it, so we can take out the coal. That's, the coal is merely the material that's been left over from being oxidized from leaves falling into lagoons, for example, and getting piled up. And normally they oxidize about, except for about 2%, and the 2% is left over. The, the, the world didn't do a good enough job at that time, so along comes consciousness and says, right, we'll just take that iron, we'll take the We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take the carbon, carbonates and we'll smelt it with, uh, smelt the iron with the coal using coal energy and, uh, and then we need to get around to the factories quicker so we'll have petroleum and we'll put it in our cars and so forth and that, that's fantastic amount of entropy generation and it's something that we use up just once over, it's, not, it's no longer cyclic, we just use it as one single pathway to make a world like ours which becomes more and more plastic and less and less metallic rather like our own uh, life, our evolution became from being extremely metallic, I would say, with very many metalloenzymes, becoming less and less metallic as the metals became shorter and shorter. So yes, I'd say uh, it's almost inevitable on a planet like this, uh, and it might be have different forms, uh, but it's because it's such a good entropy generator. A norm so in other words, we take advantage of the fourth dimension. Most of the life takes advantage kind of a three dimension, just about. But we go back and say, right, that's, I'm not going to go until the land. I'm going to go back four billion years and take all that iron out and use it now in a water. And it's very hard to reuse that stuff. You know, recycling is, still needs more and more power. But you seem to think that there's a general principle that life does what is necessary to increase the entropy of the universe. In a way. Uh, I like uh, Waddington's view that basically these are kind of statistical determinisms that uh, basically you've got these channel ways and, and the channel may is, might look a bit different on different planets but basically it's doing the same thing and it's generating entropy. So why don't we just go out, dig up all the coal and burn it and just burn it into the air? Well we are, we have. And of course, if you want to protect the planet, I mean the paradox of protecting the planet is we need to be wise about how things work. And, and my view on this, since you ask, is uh, we should be teaching the second law of thermodynamics in schools, not Shakespeare. Shakespeare can come later because it, I didn't understand Shakespeare at 14, but most kids can understand the basics of the second law of thermodynamics. And I could give you a few ri nursery rhymes to that effect. You know, so. What can we say? You know, Go uh, ahead, give us Humpty notion. Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Every kid knows that in the classroom because Jimmy just knocked over his pile of bricks. You know, this is—it's much harder to make the bricks than kick them over. That's entropy. You know, as, as Mick, Michael Jackson sang so beautifully in Wit in, in uh, Wiz, you can't win, and you can't even get even, and you can't get out of the game. These are ways to, get, to bring in the second, first and second law to kids. And we could develop that. We don't have to get overly mathematical about it. After all, as Boltzmann said, it's just counting. It's statistical law. You can break that law so long as you pay later. You've always got to pay later. And we are breaking the law all the time. Capitalism breaks the law, so to speak, because with investment so we can pay later. And the trust is that we'll be able to be paid later. 
Carl Sagan said that uh, we are the universe's way of becoming aware of itself. What do you think of that comment? Well, Suzanne said, uh, I, am, uh, I am the rocks finding their own uh, consciousness. Suzanne. Suzanne, yes. Uh -huh. So the I paper. think that was a predated to somewhat that. Uh -huh. uh, and he loved the violence of the rocks, of course. But he also loved the buoyancy of the air. So Suzanne, the, Van Gogh, these people, uh, Kushi, who, who was the person who did the wave? You know, they all understood far from the equilibrium systems. And, and we came later, the scientists came later to understand but, this. But what about the comment of we are the universe's way of becoming aware of itself? Do you think that's... Well, I think uh, that's kind of rather, I don't know, it doesn't, I mean, what's the use of saying that? Okay. Uh, at the end of the movie Contact, a little boy asked Jodie Foster's character, Ellie Arroway, uh, are we alone? And she said, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. What do you think of that comment? Well, I think it's a kind of nice glib ending to a Hollywood movie. Okay, <laughs> nice glib ending. All right. Now, I asked you what kind of aliens you'd like to find, and you I, said you don't care about them. Just I, yeah, not, I'm not looking for them, yeah. You're not looking for them? No. Huh, but I would have thought that since you were developing... They're a long way away. They, they are a long way away. They're, we're not going to see them. But they've had a long time developed, two billion years longer than Earth. Well, uh, that, they'd have run out of stuff by now. Before they make, of before they have a Yuri Milner who tries to make a star shot to uh, to uh, send a who Yuri Milner, the guy who's div donating a oh. hundred million dollars oh, yeah. for okay. a star shot to send. Yeah. Well, that's a yeah a star shot, but that isn't that with kind of little cube sats or something, yeah, yeah. or even smaller than yeah, that. I mean, that's that's stamp. not an alien. That's not an alien. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, now. When you talk to people about astrobiology and the question, are we alone, what do you think their major misconceptions are? Well, I can't speak for them, really. So, uh, but you do talk to students occasionally. Oh, I talk to students. And, and uh, what? Well, their major misconception is that they don't realize that science is not just a matter of turning the pages of the book. That what it is is to have some kind of visceral roots to the planet. And that's why I like the artists and the musicians and so forth. They have a good visceral sense of the planet. And unless one has been a geologist for some time and a prospector and worked on volcanoes and seismicity and so forth, you know, have no idea of how the Earth works. So you get into this idea of Darwin's pool and a few puddles here and there, and somehow they're supposed to go wet and dry and wet and dry. But anybody who's been a geologist and worked in Sabka environments know they're going to get stuck in there and going to lose their boots and. You know, it, it, these, you know, I know enough about getting burnt in the sunshine to know that, with, especially when there's eight times the UV there is even now, it's just a ludicrous unless you have a really good understanding of the way the planet goes. And most, that's why I would say, you know, one, always get the physics right. Whatever you do, get the physics right. But two, have a good sense of the planet. And, and uh, there's, there's ways of doing that, reading books, watching literature, and actually perhaps joining a field party on the, a geological field party, just feel what it's like to be out there, really out there, you know, and, and actually a long way from home. And, and that you do have to worry about the, the river perhaps coming up at night because so many early campers get washed away because they can't believe the river's going to rise that high, etc. You know, you've got to know these things. That's knowledge. To me, that's real knowledge. Well, what got you interested in the origin of life? Well, I, 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 one was, oh, of course, who isn't interested in the origin of life? But it never occurred to me to work on it. And I was uh, quite old. And, uh, I mean, what happened was that I was working on mineral deposits, uh, and uh, and I was working on mineral deposits that we considered were laid down on the seafloor. I'd worked in Australia. I'd worked with Australians, and they had these gigantic ore deposits like Mount Isa and MacArthur River, and, and so forth. And I was very interested. I visited those deposits. I was working on de these kind of deposits in Ireland, back home for a PhD. And when I saw. Uh, and, and I met somebody called Dick Stanton, who was a very famous, perhaps the most famous economic geologist ever from, uh, from Australia. And, and Mike Solomon, I knew both of them and had worked with both of them. And they persuaded me that this was a likely origin of mineral deposits. So we should be looking for hot springs. And I spent time in the Solomon Islands and other parts of the world looking at hot springs as well as mineral deposits. And I kind of got, got into this. And then I happened to be in Tasmania in, in 1979 or 70, 1980. And uh, Neil Williams, another economic geologist, showed a picture of the first discovery of black smokers. And, uh, you know, that, that was pretty amazing. There were no scales on those black smokers at the time, but it, they were sh shocking, you know. And it, I, so I went back to Ireland to see my students at one of these big ore deposits called Silver Mines. And I said to my students, there should be chimneys here. 
And uh, one of them said to me, what would they look like, Mike? And I said, well, I took my pen out of my pocket, took the lid off, and I said, look, they'll look like this, only be made of iron parietes. And the students said, oh, I've got a million of those. And up until that time, they had been noticed, and they'd been called fossilized monkey's thigh bones, which is something that I don't like, and, and you know, I don't like facetiousness. I like good jokes, but not facetiousness. Then they were, in fact, I think, like smokers, but they, and we published to that effect in 1980, uh, only to be met with derision because actually black smokers are very big and ours were very tiny, we oh. kind of finger size, uh, little finger size, uh, little chimneys. Uh, but we found, done some sulfur isto work and we found fossils in them that look very much like black smoker worms. So we thought we were on the right track, but nevertheless we met with a huge amount of derision uh, until, uh, well, in fact, we kept on meeting derision, but what happened to give me real hope was that, uh, that uh, I'd played chemical gardens with my children. Uh, there were nine and 11 at the time. And I'd put some crystals into what are called sodium silicate solutions. And they grow these lovely, lovely uh, kind of gardens of different colors. And uh, I was pretty pleased with them and st stuck them on the shelf. Isn't daddy clever? Uh, come, only to come home next night to find my son had locked himself in the, in the bathroom and was taking them together and uh, taking them apart. And I got a little cross about it. Andrew, out of the bathroom. Uh, no answer. Andrew, out of the bathroom now. Dinner's ready. No answer. And then suddenly he said, hey, Dad, these things are hollow. And to my shame, I didn't realize that the kind of the tiniest wee ch chimneys we found were, even tinier ones, were actually hollow. And of course, of course, they were chemical gardens. They weren't black smokers. They were chemical gardens. They were natural chemical gardens. I went into the lab the next day uh, to meet my great collaborator, Alan Hall, and uh, we said, let's go into the lab, see if we can do it with sulfides, and we could. And one of us said, and we can't remember, and that's the power of science and interaction and not being too pleased with oneself. One of us said, and it could have been Alan, I can't remember, it might have been me, uh, because we knew there were no, no organic molecules on the early Earth because we were geologists, so we didn't even think of that way. So we thought this could be significant to the emergence of life because here we've got a membrane that is inorganic and yet it's got things like iron, perhaps nickel in it, which is just, I, we happen to know, you go to the chemist shop to this day for iron tablets and zinc and so forth. So that's how it all started and we published that and, and that didn't help very much, and, uh, but we did predict Lost City uh, and fortunately 10 years later they discovered such an alkaline vent beneath the seafloor at Lost City and suddenly people thought this might be, might, um, just a few, a few people thought it might be an okay hypothesis. Well, why couldn't it be the case that instead of life on all these other planets you would have chemical gardens? Well, because the chemical garden gives you the membrane between the inside and outside, and that membrane is kind of, in a sense, a structure of the world in which the, is dis, in disequilibrium. So the membrane keeps the material on this side, which is can reduce, shall we say, hydrogen and the fuels like hydrogen and methane, and, uh, and high uh, hydroxyl, that is very alkaline, from an acidic side here with carbon dioxide in it, uh, and nitric acid or nitrate in it, uh, and protons in it. And, and there, there's a kind of struggle, there's a frustration for these things. They want to mix, but they can't because they're frustrated. Right. And I would keep on saying, you know, the, the whole point about creativity, if you look at creativity in the universe, it's always down to some kind of frustration. And they, we know that in our own lives. It's only the frustrated poets that are really good ones. And after all, Beethoven was deaf and Monet was blind. You know, we, you can't beat that for frustration, but it made them different. It, that frustration made them different. It's the same with the frustration of the membrane. It's that frustration that gives the create, creation, so to speak, of the organic molecules that eventually took over, for the most part, from the minerals uh, and those membranes. Well, and you think there's no other alternative to this frustration than to become life as we know it? Well, not that I know of. Not that we know of. Not, not, not that I could consider, a, you know. Couldn't, couldn't they make some type of little, I don't know, whirlpool or something? Like the whirlpool won't have memory. Why do you need memory? Well, you need memory so you can keep doing it and, and doing it all over the place. Other, if you have a, just a whirlpool, then things on dry land are going to get left out of that particular way of generating entropy. So it's a kind of waste, if you like, get back, in, back to Sagan's point. You know, we don't want to, you know, the life is that search engine that finds these niches that are on very different to where they started, very, very different. 
Now, since you're not looking for aliens, I guess this is an irrelevant question, but I often talk to people who are looking for SETI, SETI researchers, and I said, are you looking for God? Is like a religious aspect to it, because they're look, I say, what kind of alien do you want to find? They say, oh, some wise, somebody who's going to talk to us and tell us everything we want to know and solve all our problems. You, you, don't, uh, you don't plead guilty to that type of motivation. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> I don't believe in the Dawkins idea of emphasizing a particular point of view in religion. People need their compensations and so forth and consolation. But um, for me, the world and the universe is wonderful enough. It's a fantastic place and one can worship it, I think, through science. Uh, and I feel in that way and so I have the kind of same, I have a similar kinds of uncertainty. People think that science is about knowing things. Well, yes, you know things, but of course, as soon as you know them, you're dissatisfied because there's all that unknown beyond. And that is the kind of thing that kind of keeps one on one's intellectual and, and mental toes and is enough to make pleasure just going outside into the trees and, and, uh, and watching the stars at night. So there's enough unknowns on Earth for you uh, and you don't need, but you said you didn't like to, you don't like to think about aliens elsewhere, so there's enough well, unknowns here. I don't have to think, it's not about like, I don't have to think about aliens elsewhere. Because you have so many unknowns here. Well, I, I, yes, it, it doesn't occur to me there are aliens elsewhere that are going to be any threat to us, and therefore it's an unsubstantiable hypothesis. Okay. <coughs> and I, I would imagine that if we replayed the tape of, you know, go back in a time machine and set up things pretty similar to what the Earth had, that you would predict that something similar would evolve again? Well, it's like this Darwin's Tangled Bank, if you remember, that, that Darwin pointed out. You take the tangled bank of a river, you chop it down, and what will happen is it'll grow again, but it'll be different. But it'll be doing the same job. You can do it the same in a Wernigradsky column. You can take out stuff, and you, uh, but with, if you've got that dis certain disequilibrium between top and bottom, it doesn't matter what you put in there, they'll sort themselves out. And paradoxically, the metabolism, the general metabolism, will always be the same. The paradox is that the genes will be varying because the actual components, the actual particular uh, prokaryotes in there will be swapping themselves around. They'll be dynamic. Uh -huh. <coughs> it's, what called, it's what's called a dynamic equilibrium. Okay, what do you think of the Gaia hypothesis? <coughs> I think it's a necessary. Uh, I think it's a necessary metaphor. Uh, I think that James Lovelock, uh, he, he actually did that at JPL. Uh, he came to the idea at J Jet Propulsion Laboratory in about 1961, and took. Uh, and the job was to see if there's life on Mars or not. How would we tell? And he pointed out that you put a telescope there, or you get telescopes on, on rockets, or, uh, and you see if the planet, if the, if the atmosphere is out of equilibrium. And he kind of built this up into realizing that the Earth was out of equilibrium, but it was in a kind of stable state disequilibrium, and that must mean there's life. So that was. So he went back to his Dorsetshire village, <coughs> in uh, and walked around the uh, village green with somebody called William Golding, who wrote *The Lord of the Flies*, one of the kind of great books for this year to read, I would say. Uh, and William Golding said, "Wow, that's so good, man! You've got to have." You've got to have a name. You've got to give it its a name. And so call it Gaia, he said. So, so I think that's very interesting. But the great Bass Becking, the most wonderful of the early microbiologists in, in my book, actually thought up the idea of 1931. And he has a book, he has a, uh, a paper actually called who, who? The Gaia, Bass Becking. Bass Becking. Yeah, the, the guy who said everything is everywhere. Oh. So that great, my, uh, great man, and he made a... You know, they had a, a big institute in, in Australia called the Bass Becking Laboratories. Yes. It was closed down just as it be was becoming very, very important, unfortunately. But Bass Becking actually thought of the same idea in 1931 with the same name, Gaia. So I think microbiologists especially are going to think like that. Hmm. And, but one ob objection to it has been how do you get global level uh, adaptive features without global level competition? That would, I think Dawkins would say that. Oh, I know. I, of course that's true. Uh, well, I think it's true, but I'm, I'm talking about soft Gaia, the kind of Gaia that many people can pick up on. And one of the things he said uh, was that, you know, all I'm doing, this is James Lovelock, all I'm doing is remembering James Hutton, the first Scottish geologist, one of the first of all the great geologists. And he said, if you want to understand the planet, you've got to be a physiologist. You know, have, have that kind of mindset. And I think that's, and that's in a way what Lovelock's saying, I think, the planet. And we don't have to take it absolutely, totally serious. I mean, we're not, we're not uh, a living system that's going to spawn other worlds, even if we spawn other life elsewhere. 
Now you're doing experiments that are kind of simulating what happens at a hydrothermal vent. Yeah. Are you? Do you think you're getting closer to evolving life in the in a test tube or in the lab? En Enrique Fermi said beautifully that if you do an experiment and it comes out the way you expect, then you've made an, a, a measurement. Uh, if it doesn't, you've made a discovery. Well, some of the experiments we did did not come out the way we expected, and we think that we've made quite a discovery that way. One of the expectations of the alkaline vent theory, which I subscribe to, one of the aspects of this I subscribed to early on. Well, uh, you invented it, didn't I you? I invented it. No. Well, I, you know, invented it, yes. Well, okay. Sure. Uh, but nevertheless, I went along with the idea that serpentinization would only, not only give us hydrogen and methane, but also perhaps some organic molecules and, sulfide, and methane sulfide, for example. And we found that we just couldn't do that in the lab. All we could make was, a, was a, something called formate, uh, formic acid, basically what ants uh, sting you with. Uh, so that wasn't much of a discovery. So we'd reduce carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. But it put us into the state of saying, well, maybe life didn't, maybe life needed a little bit of a star. Maybe hydrogenating carbon dioxide is true, but right down the bottom, it was rather like having the huskies and the sledge in the morning outside the frozen, uh, your frozen tent. And what do you do? You don't get, expect the huskies to pull that sledge out of the snow. You've got to shake it free, then they can take off. How do we take, how can we shake life free, so to speak? from geochemistry, and, and we came to the conclusion that actually you come at it the other way and you oxidize methane, because there's plenty of methane in these vents as well, and they're both good fuels. And if you think about how rocketry first was often used, is hydrogen plus methane plus this oxidant with nitric acid, and boom, off it goes. Uh, and you can realize then, when you watch a rocket, that it's the exhaust that drives the rocket. You know, it's a, one, one of the things that people don't realize is it's always the exhaust that drives things. It's the exhaust that drives your car, but with a rocket, it's extremely obvious that it's the exhaust that drives the rocket. And that's similar chemistry to what, how we would think that life started. Nitrate on the outside, some carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen and methane as the fuels, they interact across one of these membranes, and yes, it takes off uh, through, so actually, it, with the maze, we would take the rocket uh, kind of scenario a little bit more significantly and say, in fact, these, the minerals we use in this, and we're, we're considering a, a mineral, as I said before, green rust, is basically like a ramjet. Uh, and a ramjet is, I don't know if you know, but locusts can't actually fly until there's a bit of wind. And they work on a ramjet principle, and they face up to the wind, and then they can all take off. But if, it, if it's absolutely still, the, the locusts can't move. They need to have that little bit of carburation to start with, or in, in this case, oxidation to start with. Mm. And I think it's very similar with this mineral called green rust. You've got to have something being forced through it. And to me, it's the proton motive force that forces, for example, nitrate through it. We can, you can force, you can interact green rust with nitrate, and eight electrons later, you've got ammonia in three hours. Now that's, that's almost taking on biology. And it's very similar structure to met, met, uh, things, something like called methane monooxygenase. So the structures of green rust are extraordinarily similar to some of the metalloenzymes, and it can do the same job. It can make ammonium out of nitrite in one hour. No biology involved. So to me, these are the first engines or enzymes, if you like, and they're not catalysts, by the way, because life has too many things to do uphill. Well, but my, I keep coming back to the question, why what you just described is, I guess, abiotic interesting thing, but why can't that be the end of it? Well, because you, because you can't, nobody's been able to, just like us, nobody really has been able to reduce carbon dioxide to organic molecules in the lab under earth conditions. They can't do it. And it's finally dawning on people that you can't do it. And actually, that's why there's life. It's because it's so difficult to reduce carbon dioxide to organic molecules. And life is what does that job. Hmm. Okay, do you have any advice for students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Uh, read books, walk in the country, take the earphones out, uh, know where you are all the time, crossing the road, on the train, feel the physics, keep feeling the physics, be totally, just be a caveman, totally aware of the dangers of the environment, and it's those dangers of the environment that make us sensitive to the way the world works. So basically, it's really uh, becoming you know, almost kind of soulful about one's life. Now, I, I mean, you'd have a good time, and, I, and you know, I, and you take, make good jokes. I'm all for that. Please don't think, you know, I'm a jazz freak. I love all, of, you know, jazz is to me, that's, that's a fantastic self-organizing system. 
And if you think about it, one of the things about jazz is that those people cannot be too egotistical because they've got to be listening. You've got to have ears, you've got to have ears, you've got to have ears. So to me, uh, yes, and so I think jazz is particularly good because it's alive. It's happening to them right in front of their faces or perhaps they can do it themselves, play trumpet, saxophone, whatever they want to do. But to me, jazz is the kind of way in. There's, there's even a book just came out called The Jazz of Physics, or it might be called The Physics of Jazz, I can't remember. And I think it's got something to say. It's not a bad book. And the guy can play, he's, he's, a, and he's a cosmologist and he plays tenor sax.